Hey y'all, I'm Tara Shaver with AARP's Office of Volunteer Engagement, and today we're keeping it virtual on the roost. I'm here with Rebecca Chaplin, Kim Dickens, and Gretchen Batra from the North Carolina AARP team, and this is the mountain team in North Carolina. Ladies, it's so good to see you, and it's been so fun chatting with you before getting started here. Welcome to the roost. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, Rebecca, why don't you open us up? Yeah, I feel I feel just even a little bit teary being here because I am just so inspired by our volunteers. And that's why I got into the work around aging to begin with. But I mean, you look at our volunteers. I mean, they're my colleagues, but they have been on the planet a little bit longer than me and they have a lot to teach me and us about how to do things well and they have great ideas. So I continue to be inspired, especially at this time when there's kind of the, a bit of a dark cloud or fear around and I can turn to our team and I can see ah, there's possibilities. And so I wanted to showcase some of the ways that our volunteers have taken of their own volition, just stepped right in, leaned right into this, this virtual reality. It's amazing. I'm so glad that you, I think you reached out maybe to my colleague, Susan, and we're just talking about some of the great things your team was doing and how proud you were um, during this time of really transition for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. everyone in the world, but for us, transition of our work. And, uh, and Susan looped me into this conversation and I just like dropped what I was doing because I was so um, excited. And like you said, I'm getting teary eyed too. Uh, <laughs> I was so excited to see how um, your volunteer team just really embraced the change and said, all right, let's pick up and, and continue on with our work and figure this out. So um, before we get into all of that, uh, tell me a little bit more about what makes your mountain region unique. Well, I was thinking about that. Volunteers, you know, around the AARP enterprise, around the planet, they all have this heart of being wanting to be a contribution to their communities. And I feel that there is something unique about the volunteers in North Carolina in the mountain region. There's some, it's like a mountain person thing. It's like there is some steadfast dedication. There's a trustworthiness. There's an integrity. There's a, a, a kindness that comes through in everything that they do that really translates into in-person settings well and I've noticed it really translates into the virtual setting well so um, the more I dive in to our community as it relates to other communities even across North Carolina the more I see that there's there's a distinction nice and so how long have you guys been working in the community and when did you become an official community presence site we started working in 2016 so we became uh, a community with a staff person in the community in 2016. Before that, we had a, f Gretchen, for example, was a volunteer here before we had a staff person in this community when we were centralized in the Raleigh office. Um, so in 2017, we became a community presence site and our team really started to mushroom quickly and, and grow quickly once we decided to have people on the ground here. That's amazing. Thank you, Gretchen, for being there before uh, before the staff and doing that great work. That was the way our first community present site in Tennessee came to be as well. We had a volunteer or a few working really hard. Gretchen, we have to know your cat's name now that we're seeing her or him. This is Cooper. It's a him. <laughs> Usually he doesn't do this. Usually it's somebody else, the other two cats. But anyway. <laughs> Cooper and you are um, sporting the exact same hair color, which I find amazing. It's like it was meant to be. <laughs> so let's get to know your team better. Kim, tell us a little bit about how you found out about volunteering and how you focus your energy um, on the volunteer team there in the mountain region. Well, I had recently moved to the Asheville area from Southern California. So I, other than some family members, which is the reason we moved here, I didn't know anybody. But what I did do was join a Toastmaster club uh, locally because I had done that in Southern California. And one of the other members had heard me talking about looking for some volunteer opportunities. And he was a friend of Rebecca's. So he hooked me up with Rebecca. And I want to say that probably in the next couple months, that's coming on three years. So uh, it's been really great for me. I have had no background in gerontology, social services, or uh, anything like that. So it's been a whole world that's opened up. 
we need to form some kind of a subgroup of AARP volunteers who have come from California. We had a lot of transplants in, in the South from California, which is just really cool. And that's often the story we hear about people saying, I, it was a great way to meet people. I just needed to, to kind of find my own way um, once we moved. Gretchen, how about you? How are you introduced to AARP and what is your specialty? I used to work for AARP in the Boston office and the North Carolina office for about, I think, 13 years. And so I've been a volunteer since 2000, which means 20 years. And I've done a variety of different things. That's what's so neat about being a volunteer is you don't have to just go in one lane. So I've worked on the driver's safety program. I've done women's financial information um, activities. And I've worked on fraud and scam prevention for about eight years. And then another, because you can do what you want to do. And I, so I work on the Home Fit program too. And then assorted other things that come up, you know, like the strategic planning and so forth that Rebecca involves us all with. Because Re Rebecca's, Rebecca's a genius. And she... She really welcomes our input and ideas and is very, very supportive. And some of us that didn't have a lot of technology background, she, she very patiently helps us through it. So that's she, how this all came to be. She is a gem and she's a fellow curly girl. So I was admiring your curls look amazing today. Um, Rebecca, <laughs> I don't know if it's super humid there like it is here, but I've been trying to keep mine looking curly all week <laughs> just for our chat today. This is the only time I'm getting recorded this week. So, <laughs> so ladies, we're here talking about this change to virtual and how the roles shifted and really how the work shifted. So um, tell me about some of the challenges that y'all faced when COVID-19 hit earlier this year. I can start and then pass the baton down down to the left to Kim if that's where she's showing up on the other screens. Um, we had a lot of plans. We had big plans. I felt like this year we were more planned out than ever before, you know, up to like that six month ahead plan where they say you want to be. And then, and they were really neat plans. And then we had to shut them all down. And I think that was the first biggest challenge to me, you know, personally, just because that had a, a, an emotional effect on us all who were invested in our, our in-person plans. Kim, what about you? Well, same thing. Um, I was, I was finally uh, getting my arms wrapped around a few things. I had finally had a successful class with powerful tools for caregivers at AARP uh, supports. And I had been teaching some prepare to care, a little bit of home fit and feeling comfortable about that. And really looking forward to in May, um, I was representing AARP at a big um, tech uh, conference that we were gonna have, where we we're gonna show all kinds of cool devices around the home to make a caregiver's life easier. And so of course, like everyone else, it's all been canceled. But on the other hand, I've learned a whole new world of how to be on Zoom and Zoom is the way of living now. And that's a skill that <laughs> I can add to my uh, belt. Gretchen, how about you? Let's see, we were supposed, the day after we started the lockdown, Rebecca and I were supposed to go up um, a, about a hundred miles away and work on a movie for grown up and a fraud presentation. <laughs> And I had everything all ready and zip closed. And I think I had at least six presentations for Home Fit ready to go. And so, but before this, we, in a way, we were ready to pivot because we'd been working, um, getting listings of our, all of our um, partners and contacts, a lot of information. So it wasn't, that hard to begin to, you know, make the, the call that said, you know, this is our situation, but what can we do to be helpful? And so, and I, I don't, I think we, we were just kind of turned a corner and kept going. So I don't remember we did any stopping. We just kept going. That's amazing. 
It is amazing. And I, I have to say, literally, I'm, I'm still misty eyed ladies. Um, no, truly, you know, there were some teams that were just stopped in their tracks because it was such a, a shock to everyone. Um, I think how quickly in some cases, you know, folks were sent home uh, to just, you know, really try to, to control, um, uh, control the spread. And there were some teams that really did take a hard pause and some of them are still kind of in that um in that mode they thought that this might not last as long as it has and is and so they thought oh we'll just ride it out and you know we'll kind of um get back to normal by the fall and as we're seeing now obviously that's not happening so tell me about some of the solutions that you guys have found to these challenges because like you said you didn't miss a beat you just made that pivot and started figuring things out kim you want to get started well, uh, keeping things going with AARP was sort of the same situation I had because I run a Toastmasters club and how could we keep uh, a club that meets every single week. So in both ways, we've been successful with AARP. We've been doing caregiver chats. In fact, because some people wanted additional subjects to be presented, we've expanded the five of those to another four. So we'll be doing nine weekly caregiver chats. And then tonight, because it dovetails together, I'm actually giving a speech, which is why I've got the white screen behind me, at Toastmasters all about those caregiver chats. So that ties in my volunteerism with the AARP into my public speaking role there. So it's great because those paths have uh, merged and learned some skills about how to do it online. And it's funny, after a while, I say to my husband, oh yeah, I've got to go to this meeting and I've got to go to that meeting and it just seems so natural because all that means is I'm going to shut my barking dog out of the room <laughs> to put on a better blouse. Yeah. But, but as far as um, I like to really concentrate on issues that family caregivers have and of course before COVID they're probably the most isolated people in the community and so now even more so when you consider that you know you can't to easily get a paid caregiver in the house or even a family member or friend to give you a respite, you can't take your loved one to adult daycare anymore. And as we all know, if they're in a nursing home or if they're in a hospital, well, shoot, what have you got? You got a phone and if they got dementia, you don't even have that communication. So actually, once you get the few people to be able to use Zoom and see how easy it is or any other online platform, this is probably the best way to reach family caregivers. Yeah, I think that's so cool that you um, uh, you saw that right away and that the, the other interesting thing, and I think we, we might get to this if we don't, we'll come back to it, but um, is that request for more topics and the frequency? I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen um, an interest and kind of a trend in folks, volunteers and the community asking for more frequency with some of the things we were doing. So we had a team that met monthly and we've been, you know, we've moved it to a weekly meeting because of just kind of how much is changing all the time, but also this need to kind of stay to connect with someone outside your home right mm -hmm. like to see somebody's mm -hmm. face that's different than the one that you're seeing every day or for some people they're not seeing anybody else and getting to interact with them in that way so um Gretchen how about you what are some of the solutions that you've found I just it, um Kim just triggered a thought that and I'll get back to your question but one of the things that's really neat is that um you know, we have a variety of different programs and because, for example, if you're focusing on one or two areas, you don't know very much about the other areas. So you can tie in with the Zoom calls or whatever platform they're using. Um, I sat in on one on entrepreneurialism. It was fascinating. I've done, you know, a variety of different um, of, of the programs. One's coming up on brain health. And so that's a real advantage. So to learn more about some of our existing programs, because mm -hmm. there's no way you can know everything. Mm -hmm. um, now, back to your question. I was trying to remember what we really did first. Rebecca, can you remember after that March 12th? What, what did we do I first? can, because Gretchen really inspired me. She dove in. I think you did the first fraud program, Gretchen, and virtually. And um, we, used, we used WebEx. And I'm just smiling because, you know, I mean, it is 
a, a different interface. It's not as friendly as Zoom. And she just did it. She went right out there. We probably had 20 or so people come in and she just, she just did it. Even though there was the lag time with the voice and the, you know, the video and the audio, she just did it. And she was so charming and so wonderful. And uh, that was with the attorney general's office. And then the next week we did one with the secretary of state or two weeks later. And again, it was a, a big audience and she was so calm and you had never used WebEx, I don't think. And yesterday we did um, one in collaboration with the YMCA. And so we were combining formats and the, the Y was the chief sponsor and then we were combining in and we had a PowerPoint presentation, but I couldn't see it because whatever format we we're using, I couldn't see it. So, okay, fine. Fortunately, I'd kind of written down what each slide had, but all of a sudden in the middle of it, everything went blank on my screen. So I couldn't see Rebecca and, and fortunately I'd written down kind of a list of what the different slides were, at least a, a word that clued me in. So we were, we were really working in the dark that day, but we tried to proceed as if there weren't too many technology problems. It was pretty funny though. You would oh, never like know. You would never know that that happened really? if you were watching it because she just glided right along. I mean, it was remarkable. I was going to say, I think uh, all this thinking on our toes and having to deal with issues like that is probably creating us some new brain pathways and firing synapses we haven't used in a while. So we're probably um, all getting smarter during this time with figuring all of this stuff out and um, incre increasing the brain health, uh, the the, the health of our brains. There we go. <laughs> so, so what do you think you guys are, you've talked about how um, you guys address the, the shift. How about the rest of your team? How has that been in terms of embracing the technology and, um, and kind of jumping in, not only to participate, but maybe even to the production of, of these things? How's the rest of the team feeling about all this? Well, I I'm not muted, so... <laughs> I could say this, um, Rebecca got us to have a weekly um, chat that had nothing to do with business, just a get together with volunteers. We could talk about gardening, weather, how we're living under COVID and all that. And that's been really nice to just go on with zero agenda. Anyone wants to, to join. So I think that, uh, Everyone, I assume that they're probably doing that all across the country, but boy, it's it's nice. I think where I've heard that they're doing it, they would agree. That's exactly right. There are a couple of states who've really embraced that, um, and uh, some even have cute names for that meetup. Um, and they they've said it's really been a value to their team for a lot of different reasons. Gretchen. Um, yeah, because you know, being on the leadership council which anybody can come to, but there's sort of a bunch of us that are regulars, we're all friends. And so this it's really important, the linkages that we have and we, the appreciation we have for each other. There are a couple of downsides, which um, my fraud team, I did have nine people on the team. A couple of the people for various reasons have had to, um, withdraw that didn't have anything to do with the technology but I'm having a hard time nudging people along so I'm trying to figure out things that Rebecca calls the soft touch how to adapt some of our things in print and say can you take this to your local newspaper about this fraud or can you be sure to get people to sign up for the fraud watch network and a variety of different, so I'm trying hard to think of ways to keep them engaged because losing volunteers is, you know, you've worked hard, you've gotten them trained, and so that's an issue. And then I work with a couple of chapters and I've been sending them information as Rebecca develops um, what's coming up, I send them information, but a lot of them aren't don't have computers, so they have trouble communicating with their chapter members. So these are some of the challenges that we have. 
Yeah, I think that um, issue of engagement is something that definitely others are feeling um, because there are some who, as you have done, jumped right to the challenge and said, okay, if we don't know it, we're going to learn it and we'll fake it till we make it and it's going to be great. Um, and there are others who, for various reasons, have, you know, kind of stepped back in our rural areas. A lot of times it's their connections aren't great enough for them to participate, even in, you know, a Zoom chat, um, which has been pretty limiting. But, um, but like you said, a variety of reasons that people have maybe had to step away from things that they were really involved in. I feel that when one person steps out and you lose a volunteer to, uh, you know, life stuff, it, it's like a breakup or something. It's like a real, uh, it, it hits you really hard because um, you are more than just, you know, people doing work. You really become, form those relationships and, and spend a lot of time together. So, um, yeah, I know others who are listening to us can, can definitely relate to that. So for you guys, um, what are some of the things that you're most proud of uh, about this transition into the virtual space? Well, for me, it, it, it's huge because I've always felt that it was very important to keep my mind strong to be able to speak in public and to present myself in public. And certainly without virtual connections like this, I could see it being a real slippery slope and I'm sure it is for many. So that's why I do worry about volunteers that have dropped off because they're not probably dropping off to do other volunteer work because ARP's got so many different things to do, but it may be just because they've got a lot of other, there's lots to be worried about and concerned about. And if you're watching the news, it's pretty easy to say, I'm just gonna shut myself out of the world. But for me, uh, to continue to be able to present myself and speak um, online and have things to research and learn about is the only way I can keep my mind fresh. I build on that because I think just the opportunity to learn new things um, around fraud, unfortunately, there's always new information and I get um, link in with the FBI and the Federal Trade Commission and other it's, it's attorney general and so forth. So there's always new information coming in. I feel a little bit overwhelmed with this, especially the new COVID scams. Um, and then the other thing that's sort of fun is when people say, oh, a Zoom, you know, and I go, oh yeah, we've been doing that because we use Zoom for a couple of years for the leadership council and now we're using different pl platforms. So we, um, again, Rebecca <laughs> shepherds us along through all of this, but you know, it's really neat to be on some of the cutting edges of uh, learning, learning things, just like Kim said, trying to keep learning. Yeah, and like you said, those the scams that as you were talking, I was like, oh, and that opened up a whole new world, even for fraud, the fraud volunteers, and we've got the digital fraud fighters, and there's an episode about that um, on the roost as well. But just the COVID testing, who would have thought that would have become a scam? Not me, but then again, I don't have the mind of a scammer. So <laughs> it's um, it's so interesting to to just see how things like that have even added to the work that we're doing um, at AARP. Kim, were you going to say something? I just wanted to say, and I hadn't said before, but really having, you know, Rebecca out there, when you've gotten to know Rebecca and you're her friend like Gretchen and I are and most of the whole team is, you just can't let her down. So just because COVID happened, I'd feel terribly guilty if I had just pulled the uh, sheets over my head. So she motivates me. She is so busy out there. She motivates me to hold up my end of the, the work. Yeah. And Rebecca? That's so funny. <laughs> I think, you know, I think that it goes really, you know, you tell me that and it's, it's, it speaks to how much we are like a family and there is this inter um, dependence between us. Like we, we need each other and we show up for that because we know we're important as a part of this ecosystem of AARP. And I feel almost the same way. You know, I feel an accountability. I know that Kim has this gift for doing, you know, program powerful tools for family caregivers. And I want her to share that gift. And so, you know, for me, it's showing up to provide that space and opportunity. So I feel like there is this, a lot of supporting one another in a whole new way. And we, we have lost some volunteers and, 
it, it, we do worry about them, but we also know it's okay because, because life flows like that and we can stay in touch as friends. And um, the people who are showing up are like showing up in a really big way. You know, and I think that this, um, you're right, it is okay. And thank you for saying that, Rebecca, because this is something that I think we don't talk about a lot. And um, for all the reasons, uh, at any time, you know, folks may step away from their work with AARP, and that is absolutely okay. And I think um, we as leaders, and whether staff or volunteer, can't beat ourselves up too much about not keeping someone involved because it's, you know, it's, it is a two-way street. It's not all just on what we've done. It really has to do with what's happening in life and circumstances circumstance and everything else and um, just as interesting as the folks who've had to step away I've seen new faces step forward um, and people who maybe had um, been volunteering or maybe had just started volunteering and things changed for them and they said whoa this was an important part of my life I've got to find a way to keep doing that and maybe it wasn't possible in the roles that they had had before um, and so they've stepped up and stepped in in a big way I have five or six volunteers who are totally new to AARP who have joined me on a team that's all virtual. And one of them told us a couple weeks ago um, at the end of the, she said, I just have one more thing to say before we hang up. I'm so happy to meet new people. And we were like, oh, okay. You know, she said, no, for months, I haven't met anyone new. I've done lots of Zooming and phone calls and everything else with people that I know. But uh, meeting all of you has been a real gift to me during this time because I am always meeting new people. And she was like, I was really struggling with that. So I think that's also a cool part of, of even people who come who come to our virtual events you know who who uh, change that blouse and go get in a quiet room and participate are feeling that some of that same energy you know when they get to be in a room a virtual room with people that they maybe don't already know it's also um, inspiring to them so um, if we haven't already talked about uh, all of them for you what have been some of the surprises or the biggest surprises that have come to you as you've moved into this world anything that we haven't talked about yet I'm just surprised at how really easy it is. And I wish I had uh, bought a lot of stock in Zoom a year ago. <laughs> and I know there's other platforms, but really it's all about if you have the connectivity. And so that's a, that's a big issue in the country. But once you have connectivity, really, this is just easy for everyone. Think of all the school teachers trying to herd, you know, kindergartners <laughs> from a screen. So. I've learned that there is really nothing that can happen in our world to stop us from moving forward. Yeah, good observation. Gretchen? I think, I think as we, you know, even when eventually we get through all of this, that some of these um, techniques will continue to use. They just make a lot of sense, not always getting in the car and going somewhere where we, we can connect this way. So. And who knows what's going to be evolving in the next few months because um, stuff is hap whoops, two cats on here now. Um, <laughs> I mean, stuff is evolving fast. I mean, we talk about Zoom, but now you had one the other day you were talking about, Rebecca, something stream. I hadn't heard of that one. And so there's, there's lots of things. But the thing that's so nice is so for so many families, they're having like reunions with their family members. It's really a gift to, to people. Yeah, people are really thinking differently about, uh, at the, as you said, you know, Kim, if, if folks had realized it was so easy and that there, these possibilities were there, who knows what folks would have done before. Um, and it's that, that really brings us to the next question of let's look look to the future a little bit and you know eventually things will go back to normal where we all feel that it's okay to be together in person again um, what parts of this work that you've um, found in the virtual space do you think will stick around well um, here in the mountains when it even uh, snows the tiniest bit it shuts the whole place down or if we have excessive rain of flooding. So I would say that this will be an easy backup to those mm -hmm. in-person meetings. So there won't be anything that ever has to be canceled. And certainly, um, again, not to reiterate too much, but when it comes to family caregivers, here's a group that doesn't have the time to get in their car and drive 
to a place and meet and be away. Here, you're on this meeting and suddenly your care receiver has a problem or needs you, you're right there. So I think that it's gonna really widen up um, the possibilities for those that may not drive, may have a care receiver or other health issues that prevent them from going out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm building on that because we're in the mountains, um, broadband isn't fully available to everybody. And I think this virus has brought up some of the issues of our, our lack of things. So as we hopefully get more funding from the government or whatever, um, that everybody will, will be on an equal platform. And that will really help us in our work a great deal and help all sorts of people. And I'm just trying to separate these guys. And, um, <laughs> and um, for, for everything, for, for telehealth, for educational opportunities. For, so we really need that piece of our, um, of our abilities to move forward. Yeah, telehealth, that's, that's a big deal. Being able to see your doctor virtually in a few minutes. Yes, and not have to drive and wait. Yeah, and not have to sit there in a waiting room full of, you know, flu and cold people, especially in the fall and winter. Anyway. Absolutely. Um, I think the people that, uh, we were going to talk about it in May at our tech conference, like it was something um, really new. And I think that virtual reality has done it. All sorts of people have had an appointment with their doctor virtually, and now it's going to be old hat. We're living the tech conference, Kim. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking. Would you ever have thought you, you probably have uh, explored every single thing you were planning to talk about at the tech conference by now? <laughs> well, we don't have the virtual pets, which I heard are quite oh, a yes. thing. <laughs> really? Virtual cats and dogs for people who, they, you know, Really? Yeah. I'm going to be Googling that later <laughs> to find out. <laughs> so um, what are you all looking forward to most when we get back together in person? <laughs> I think some big hugs will be in order, but I have a feeling we'll see each other in person before the physical touching. So it's going to be, it's going to be a slow time to get back to what we did before, if we ever do. Will we be in a room, but still always distance? We're going to get sort of trained to distance ourselves. And I don't know if that's good or bad. It would be interesting. Yeah, that's, um, that's something I was, I've given a lot of thought to over the last couple of days about how once you kind of get programmed into that, how weird it's going to be to go back to, you know, what, what we've trained ourselves out of is going to be weird. Rebecca, <laughs> Gretchen, how about y'all? What are you looking forward to? It's, it's really fun to do things in person, you know, if you're doing a presentation, a class, whatever, because you get a lot more feedback. We can't get much feedback this way. Um, so that'll be fun. But just rescheduling everything that's had to be canceled, um, that's going to be a challenge, but we can do it. <laughs> we're ready it's sort of hard because you kind of got to pull in the reins every so often because somebody says oh I'm going to go do this this and this and we go no wait 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 um, we can't do any in-person stuff for till the end of the year it's at the really, earliest yeah. yeah it's really hard and I'm looking forward to some of that middle path stuff I I was dreaming about driving movies like before we got to COVID and I was just so excited when they said driving movies is going to do it and now they're they're um they're saying not yet. So I think that whenever they happen, I think drive-in movies are going to be awesome and I'm excited for it in decent weather. And and just kind of like I'm excited about a new way of thinking of things. Like I love that Kim and Gretchen brought up that we have this backup plan now of whether something else gets in the way, we, we feel equipped. Um, so I'm looking forward to the hybrid. I love that the Secretary of State can pop right into our th events for 10 minutes, even though she's very busy, and we can get a superstar. Or, you know, Tara Shaver right here from Tennessee, that only takes a moment. So I love that we can kind of bring these two worlds together, and I'm excited about the innovation that'll lead to. That is for sure. Um, 
one of the things that that I've heard from teams saying even people who said they were resistant to the technology or to the team meetings or whatnot um, one person told me a couple weeks ago that they said I, I think we're going to keep our team meetings virtual regardless because we've all realized we're so busy anyway that it's a way that we can all make sure we've got the maximum opportunity to participate and you know they're like like you said and then show up in person when you when it's really needed um, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is traveling and getting to be with teams like yours and you know getting to um, to really feel that energy in the room you feel it a little bit from uh, virtual but not not it's not quite the same. And, um, and so that'll be something I'm really looking forward to. But like y'all, I think that blend of what sticks and how people are really thinking differently about what's necessary. Um, the thing that our team has learned is that the length of time we used to require spending with people has been drastically reduced. <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to get attention for four hours. You've got a 40 minute window, maybe an hour that we, we can get people's attention. And so it has really made us rethink what, uh, what is important to bring into the room when we're having a, a uh, training or a conversation. So, um, Rebecca, do you have any closing thoughts about your team and the the pivot that you all have made to the virtual world? I feel our team kind of speaks for themselves here, and Kim and Gretchen are great examples of the type of innovation that I'm so proud to be a part of. So, that's all. Ladies, anything else you'd like to add before we wrap? That's no, covering the water. <laughs> I, and the only thing I think that perhaps we'll get some more volunteers coming out when when they can really get behind the vote and getting out the vote or I think that that will energize people and I'm hoping some volunteers will return when they realize how important that is. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think my prediction is also when we all are able to gather back in person that people are going to be so eager to connect with others that it also brings some people back to us or some people to us for the first time because of all the great stuff we've been doing virtually. Um, I think we'll, we'll see some new faces in real life uh, when that time comes. Well, ladies, Rebecca, Gretchen, Kim, thank you so much for being with me today. And you guys have just been amazing. And I look forward to the time when we can gather and break bread together hopefully in person and uh, thank you all for listening or for tuning in on YouTube and we'll see you next time.